Hey, today's video is about why you'd build an open source SaaS. Now, a lot of people are confused about this topic. This is something I get asked about a lot. And even from investors, I expect would maybe know a bit more about it. I also get some quite confusing comments. So hopefully this helps you better understand open source, commercial open source. And even if you're an open source founder, maybe you can send this video and uh, send it to your investors to better educate them. Um, but yeah, let's jump into things. Now, this video is based on a blog post I wrote a few months ago. So if you prefer just reading it, I'll put the link in the description below. Um, I'm going to talk about why you might want to build an open source SaaS. I'll also talk about the downsides. People are always asking that, oh, what if someone steals my code? And also, why would someone even pay me? If it's open source, can't they just run it for free themselves? So what is an open source project? An open source project is a project whose code is open. So it will be hosted somewhere like GitHub. And it will also have a license that allows you to do uh, different things with it and run it yourself. A commercial open source project, you can commercialize it. So it runs like any SaaS. And so an example of that is Posthog. Posthog is an open source SaaS. It's a very popular analytics platform today. It's making over $10 million a year, which is really great considering how new it is. You have projects like Cal.com, which is an open source Calendly alternative. It's raised over $30 million in funding. You have massive companies like Sentry that have been around forever, GitLab, many, many others. WordPress, half the internet or a large portion of the internet runs on that. They make a lot of money as a company and it's fully open source, but they're still able to commercialize it with their own SaaS offering. And lastly, Inbox Zero, that's the platform I'm working on. It's a SaaS, it has monthly plans and it's generating revenue. If you'd like to see some more of these, go, you can go to oss.gallery and here you'll see lots of different examples. So for example here, Badger, or you can see Inbox Zero on the page as well. So all these projects, the codes are open. If you want, you can go and run it and host it yourself. But if you don't wanna host it yourself, the easiest way to do it is have someone else host it for you. So the same way, if you're gonna put up a WordPress blog, some people will host it themselves, but many people will use wordpress.com or the WordPress company or some other hosting service to host it for them. I use Posthog myself, I use cow.com myself. I don't host either of them. I just pay the SaaS fee to use those platforms. So why would you wanna build an open source SaaS? Why not just keep the code hidden like most companies do? Well, for one, you have a lot more transparency and credibility. So for example, in the Posthog example, if I want, I could go in and check what's happening, like what code is running, and I have full transparency on that. The same with Inbox Zero. You can see exactly what happens when you click certain buttons. If you are a developer, you could see um, how, how your information is being used. Another one is privacy. So when you build something that's open source, the company, another company, can go and self-host it themselves. And this is highly beneficial if somebody cares a lot about their privacy. So for example, Cal.com is a Calendly alternative. It helps you schedule your meetings. But if you're a government, you probably don't want to use Calendly because now all your data is with Calendly. They can see every single meeting you've booked and you probably don't want that. But if you wanted, you could use something like Cal.com and then all the data is safe with you. It's your database. Cal.com doesn't have access to any of it. And this is really important for a lot of different industries. Things like government, healthcare, I mean, even just big startups, you in a lot of cases, you just want to control your own data. You don't want it going to other providers. And the same with Inbox Zero. You can self-host it so no one else can get access to your emails. It's just between you and Gmail. Or with Posthog, only you have the analytics data. Posthog, the company, doesn't. Now, you might be thinking, I don't care about privacy. And that's okay. You can always go and use the SaaS. Like I said, Posthog, Cal, Inbox Zero, we all have hosted SaaS platforms. Half the companies you'll see on OSS Gallery have that as well. But for certain people, being able to self-host is really beneficial. So this is one reason you would do this. And I know you're thinking, oh, no, you can't monetize. I'm going to get to that later in the video, so stay tuned. Another major benefit of being open source is that now anyone can contribute to the code base. So imagine some uh, platform like Inbox Zero, and you want it to do something that the core platform doesn't allow for but you see that there's only a sort of a little bit of extra work that has to happen and then it will work well for your use case. So because the platform is open source, you can go and extend it in the way that you want. And this actually benefits everyone because when you go and extend the functionality for Inbox Zero, it then helps everyone because you contribute it back to the code base and now everyone benefits for that update. Or to make it even clearer, let's say Cal.com has integrations with lots of other third-party apps but there's a third party app that's missing. You want it to connect to Slack, but they don't have the Slack integration yet. So because this app is open source, anyone can go and contribute that integration. Another benefit is longevity of the product. 
So an open source product, the code is there and you'll always be able to rely on it, that you'll be able to run the code yourself. So even if the platform eventually shuts down, it doesn't mean that everything is just gone forever, which happens in many cases. Instead, you'll be able to continue running it. And this is a huge reason that a company might decide to use your platform over someone else. If they know you're open source, but the other platform's closed source, closed source and has high risk of shutting down, so they might choose the open source platform for that reason. And the last point I'll mention on this is the marketing side of things. So open source is sort of like an extreme version of build in public. If you're familiar with the build in public movement where everyone's sharing their MRR screenshots on Twitter and showing how much they're growing and building their business, well, open source is a form of that. It's building in public, building in the open. People love to follow along and it also has a ton of goodwill. Open source in general, because it's open, people love it. If you look at Product Hunt, by the way, so many of these products I mentioned in the video came top on Product Hunt. Posthogcal.com, Inbox Zero, Dub.sh, like loads of others, Papermark, uh, Papermark, Uninbox, it's just the list goes on. And so you get that marketing boost from being open source. You get the open source community pushing you. You get a lot of goodwill because it's open source. And you even get GitHub trending, which is like this like subtle way of growing, but it's really, really popular. So if you get 20,000 GitHub stars, this happened to maybe finance actually, they raised, I think it was like $1.5 million. It was a dead project. They open sourced it. Suddenly it started to get a ton of traction just via the GitHub trending page because all the developers in the world were seeing it when they were looking at GitHub trending. And that actually scored it that additional funding in like almost no time after it just went super viral on GitHub. So something to think about. Ah, and the last reason I forgot to mention, because you can self-host, now there's no lock-in as well. So for a lot of platforms, you start using them and then you're stuck on them and now you're locked into that platform forever. When it's open source and the, the company behind it can charge you any amount they want because you know you might be stuck there and it's just like, well, they want you to pay a million dollars a year, you need to do it. But if the platform's open source, you can actually decide to move off and just host it yourself and then not pay that extortionate fee that they want from you. So it stops locking, which is another major, major benefit. And you might be thinking, well, that's not good. I'm As a startup, I'm losing revenue. But it's actually very good as well because every reason that your customers have to use you, that's a win for you. And that's a reason they will use you instead of the closed source alternative. It might be that one day they decide to move off and it might be that you might not be able to have like monstrous pricing because then they'll just find another way to do it and self-host. That's okay. But the, the upside of all of this is they chose to use you in the first place. Everyone's using posthog.com. Some of those people using Postdoc, it's because it's open source and they know they can always go and self-host themselves. So I know you've got a ton of questions now. I'm going to jump back and talk about some of the reasons you might not want to be open source and also answer these questions that might be popping up in your head about like every all those alarm bells going off being like, oh, my code is open. So let's talk about that now. So firstly, the biggest question, won't someone steal my code if it's public? And what I would say is just look at open source companies in practice and I basically don't know any real cases of where a company has been cloned because this code is open source. So a big one is Sentry or GitLab. Do you know the Sentry V2 that is, you know, that stole Sentry's code? I don't know it. And every company I just mentioned in this video, I don't know the alternative to them. I don't know the cow.com clone, which is the cow.com exact code base deployed somewhere else. And people are using that. And honestly, me as a user, I wouldn't want to use the fake cal.com. I wouldn't trust the people behind it. They're not the, I mean, one, it's somewhat dishonest, but also like I wouldn't trust them to run it properly or look after the data or anything because, you know, they're not the original creators of this software. Another point here is that the license actually matters. So if you decide to go and clone cal.com, the license is something called AGPLv3. It actually uses a few licenses in its code base. But its license means you need to keep your project open source if you decide to go and clone it. So if you do start contributing, then the original cal.com team could continue to uh, make benefit from those changes as well. And the other part is for cal.com specifically is they have some code which is under an enterprise license. And so if you want to use these enterprise features, you can't actually self-host them, at least not per the license. You could be a huge enterprise that decides to, you know, uh, cheat or break the rules and self-host it, but it's probably just not worth it for the big enterprise to do that. And, you know, they should just be going and paying cal.com for the service, that the, the fee they need to pay. And so you'll see a lot of open source projects doing things like this, where they have two licenses or part of the code base is not deployed. So for example, Novu, their enterprise, 
uh, feature plan is actually not even public. So the, the core platform is open source, but if you want to use their enterprise features, you won't be able to unless you use their platform because that part of the platform just isn't open. So there are a lot of different ways you can play around with it. Um, and yeah, licensing is definitely a big part of it. But you need to realize that code is somewhat of a commodity this day, these days. Just because the code is public doesn't mean I can, you know, like if Twitter's code was public, I couldn't do anything with it. You know, I can't just, I could easily clone the code for Twitter myself or write something similar. I could have it up in a week probably, but that's not the business. The business there is like the huge network, the awesome content that, that's there, the network effect is just impossible to break into. And that's not just Twitter with that network effect. You know, if I clone Posthog or Cal, it's like, where are my customers? Um, who's going to use me? How do I build trust with them? And as a clone, it's going to be imp nearly impossible to build that trust. It could be there's some secret source in the code. And now, you know, because it's open, you can go and understand it and build it yourself. In most cases, I wouldn't say there's some piece of magic that is so incredible that just that, that you need to have the code to do it. I think in many cases, you could probably just use the product and figure out yourself how to go and implement it. But in general, that's not really the challenge. I don't, and so I don't think it hurts many open source companies either. Now I'll finish off this part saying, of course, it's up to you if your project is open source or not. It'd be naive to think that it's impossible for someone to come and take your project and do something better with it. Um, depending on the size of the company, I have seen in cases where the companies are a bit smaller that um, there have been clones that are like sort of doing quite well and were allowed based even on the license. So it, it's really up to you as a founder to decide if it makes sense. But there are, with anything, there are a lot of pros and a lot of cons. Um, and a lot of the cons you think you're worried about here, just like in practice and looking at companies that exist, they're just, they're, they're not real issues. Intuitively, you might think they are, but yeah, and just in practice, they're not. Another very good question is why doesn't so why would someone even pay me if my project is open source? Why don't they just go and run it themselves? And now I've lost the revenue. And the point behind open source projects is, yeah, you can go and do that and run the project yourself. But once again, in many, many, many cases, the companies won't actually want to go and run it themselves. They want someone to run this software for them. In the case of Inbox Zero, there are thousands of people that have signed up to the platform. I don't know how many people have deployed it themselves, but like the number that uses the hosted platform that I run is significantly higher than anyone self-hosting it. Self-hosting it, one, has its own fees. So if you need to set up your own server and start running it, and just that might cost you $50 a month to run the platform just for yourself, or maybe $20 a month. So you might as well just pay me to maintain everything, keep it going. Um, rather than running it yourself. And even, this is true for big companies as well. Like they don't necessarily want to pay uh, to maintain one other piece of software themselves. They want another company to go and run it for them. But one of the big benefits is that when or if they decide to run it themselves, they can. And that optionality can be very valuable to people. And the takeaway here is every like corn you see to the business running the open source SaaS is often a positive to the company on the other end of it. And if it's a positive to your customers, so that, that is often good for you as, uh, as a general rule. If you make your users happy, it's good for your business uh, too. You might sometimes need to think of different ways to monetize or how that impacts you and think about different things. Those are legitimate questions, but just realize it's not all bad just because somebody could potentially self-host it. So that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, go check out Inbox Zero, which is an app that I'm building, which helps you automate and clean up your inbox in minutes. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this. Usually I do a coding video, so I jump into an open source project and I look at the code behind it and explain how it works. And it's a great way to learn from real world projects. And remember, there are a lot of open source companies out there. This is a new concept for a lot of people, but here you can see GitLab, a public company with over 2000 employees, 20. Um, it just like SST, you might be familiar with. The list just goes on and on, Apollo, uh, Superbase is another you'll find on this list, TipTap, Posthog, and these are just companies that YC has funded, okay? Traceloop, Trigger.dev, so many of these. Um, there are thousands of these companies out there. Many of them are making good money, even though they are open source. Open source does not mean free. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed and let me know what you think. And if there are any reasons I missed or places you disagree, I'd be more than happy to hear your feedback.